back. It's time for the 2024 Urban Nerd Con. Join us in Atlanta, Georgia, April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel. Special guests include Underworld creator Kevin Grievous, Gary Gray from Fairly Odd Parents, from Nickelodeon, Giovanni Samuels, the Science Machine Michael Green, the Sci Fi Sisters, and from Spaceballs and Star Trek Voyager, Tim Russ. Hi, I'm Tim Russ. Join me April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia for the Urban Nerd Con. Our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone con. I'll see you there. Live long and prosper. Visit TheUrbanNerdCon.net to get your buy one, get one free badges before the price increases. Remember, our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See Yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh. And boy, boy, I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a lot. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Yeah. Talkin they can press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention, Boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Cavill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. The behind the scenes talk now texts are out of control. Charles, <laughs> I'm going to get you. I'll it. Yes, indeed. Guilty. <laughs> Welcome to 484 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show that's covered the sporting HBC dash for all things HBC sports. For institutions large or small, from the NEIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBC athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBC athletic programs and the business of HBC sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, along with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live, KCOH 1230 AM studios, with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer, multi-Hall of Famer, Ralph Cooper, and the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Mike Washington is out on assignment. I see Professor Bishop is here. Man, I got to shout out Professor Uncle Neely. I heard he was doing a lecture back there yeah. in Colorado. <laughs> Tell him he can send me my fee. I'm the first one to put that professorship adjunct in the light. Now he all big time. He act like he can't talk to me. So I'm going ho- to holler at that man. I see him out there uh, uh, teaching uh uh, the, the 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 benefits and pitfalls of social media. Of course, uh, what he's done with the pregame show uh, in terms of uh, uh, the expansion uh, of of the YouTube subscribers and things of that nature, uh, tremendous. Especially uh, when you take a look at the origins of the pregame show and now where it is, and uh, it continues to be a good friend of the show as well. So. Yeah, he is. Shout out to him. I was the first one on that gig that he started up. Now he didn't went on big time. He don't text me. I know he texts you and tell him, tell him next time he texts you to disturb you doing the show, I'm going to get it. <laughs> Especially when he act like he's too big time to text me unless he want to put uh, one of my students under the, <laughs> the bush. Uh, talk about uh, he's in some other fraternity. Uh, I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it. Steph Show Ready. Steph Show Ready. Yeah, I know. Herman shout, shout out to Herman. Herman, shout out to Herman. Speaking of shout outs, I want to shout out Ralph Cooper. Uh, for coming and speaking to my class today. Uh, oh, my class, you. they're doing uh, an assignment in which they're, uh, I mentioned it the other day, they were, they're doing uh, an assignment on Lloyd Judge Wells. Uh, of course, one of the architects of the Kansas City Chiefs early teams. Of course, uh, we know about all that he's done with regards to bringing HBCU players into the AFL and NFL space and uh, just having a tremendous career, not just in being one of the first African-American pro, pro scouts 
but in sports marketing in general. I mean, he's part of the Muhammad Ali entourage, but Ralph Cooper covered him, talked about him today. Students tremendously engaged. So SPMT 476, thank you for giving me your time and lending your ear to uh, Houston Radio legend Ralph Cooper this morning. I'm just hoping that he didn't share all of his stories. <laughs> That's all I'm doing. I'm a little he nervous. Just, hey, he, he I don't want to call to the dean's office. <laughs> it's like, uh, what? No. Uh, no, I, don't, I, I couldn't imagine a better person to bring alive somebody of that historical nature that is not with us. So in all seriousness, the fact that you have that impact on your students is significant because you're connecting these bridges, if you would, from the past obviously, to the current, to the future uh, in terms of those generations. So your ability to navigate this space um, to make sure what they pull out and recover from their notes, um, they get to talk to somebody that can give them some in-depth uh, analysis of it. And you can't get that when you're talking about artifacts alone. So the fact that you brought that to the table is uh, what I'm talking about and what it means to move trajectory in terms of being a professor and doing it at that level. So credit to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's pretty big time. A professor in the professor in and doing it like yeah. that. Yeah. We try. We trying to do some things over there. Some more things. Is that oh, there you go. Today's yeah, episode more. of Inside the HBC Sports Lab is sponsored by THG Agency LLC. THG Agency is a company that provides sporting and educational consulting and data analytics. One last thing before I tie it to you and ask your news of the day. I did get a call that somebody else wants me to reach out to you and wants you to reach out to them because they want to use your service. I get a little nervous because every time I look up, I get a call. I think it's for me and a chance for me uh, maybe to, you know, update my pockets. And then all of a sudden they ask about y'all. I lay all off. <laughs> I don't have to find a finder's fee, agent fee. Wow, I know, up. right? <laughs> <laughs> Big things on the way. Big things on the way. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is, I guess. Well, go ahead. Show us some show us some love with some news of the day. What is your mind? I mean, it's big, big week. Signing day. Uh, always up to date with some football, basketball going on. Baseball is fitting to come out there. Which direction yeah. do you want to go? What's up? Well, you mentioned, let's talk a little baseball because the SWAC announced their baseball preseason awards. Uh, the SWAC announced its 2024 baseball predicted order of finish along with the preseason teams and individual award selections uh, this afternoon. So let's start off at Alabama State. They were picked to finish first in the SWAC Eastern Division. The Hornets tallied seven first place uh, points, so 74 points. Bethune Cookman uh, picked to finish second. Florida AM picked to finish third. Jackson State fourth. Alabama AM fifth. Valley sixth. Uh, in the SWAC East. In the SWAC West, the Gramlin State Tigers were tabbed and finished in first place in the SWAC's Western Division. The Tigers amassed seven first place votes. They are followed by Prairie View uh, at, at, at number two. Uh, behind them, the Southern Jaguars, uh, Texas Southern predicted to come in fourth, Arkansas Pine Bluff fifth, Alcorn sixth. So those teams, they highlight uh, the predicted order of finish in the SWAC East and SWAC West. And I want to mention that Grandma State's Cameron Buford, he was named the preseason player of the year, while Bethune Cookman's Daniel Gaveria was tabbed as the preseason pitcher of the year. Of course, Dr. Gaveria, we're working on a special next week where we want to uh, take a look at a baseball preview, if you will, uh, here on Dr. Gaveria's Inside the HBC Sports Lab, working with uh, sports information directors now, contacting our baseball coaches, and we'll have as many of those coaches uh, on the show next week, but looking forward to kind of giving a, a baseball preseason preview as we get started with the Cactus Jack Classic. We also got a classic over in Atlanta at Rush Chandler Stadium. Uh, so we got a lot MLB of MLB classic. Baseball. MLB classic. We got a lot of baseball on tap as we get into latter January. I'm sorry, latter February. And then moving into, of course, swag basketball tournament. But the ping of the bats getting ready to start next week. Yeah, which means you know you're going to get in a little bit of softball as well because Shivery is not dead when you talk about what's going on there. It's going to be fascinating, and you have that both in the MEAC and the SWAC. But before I turn to that, when you talk about uh, the SWAC baseball, I mean, Jackson was a perennial top team in the East. They still are winning like 30 games. That yeah. tells you the depth 
of the SWAC, particularly when you look at the dis- divisions, when your fourth place team is one, none other than Jackson State. Uh, that is deep when you talk about uh, what you have to do with the gauntlets there. And then you turn over to uh, the West and you got Southern third. Yeah. Yeah. Southern perennial, third? perennial swag champion. Southern Jaguars are uh, predicted to finish third. Uh, I tell you the depth of talent uh, in, in, this, in this swag with regards to baseball, uh, tremendous. When you take a look, uh, one, one through eight, it, I mean, it's, it's going to be a fight to get into that swag tournament. Uh, uh, or uh, and playing that SWAT tournament, and then we saw some great games in the SWAT tournament last year. Tremendous games, uh, pitching, uh, and timely hitting, all that came into place. I'm looking forward to a great SWAT baseball season. Kind of where Charles debuted his talents at SWAT baseball, so you know that's one reason baseball is really fond of him. He you know kicked it off officially of taking that next step in a lot of ways doing some broadcast. I know he did his gifts with BCSE and one of. Throw some love out there to Roy, uh, who always gives the voice uh, from a prominent perspective of providing action of our HBCUs, whether it's NIA and oftentimes NCAA Division II uh, in regards to uh, playing multiple sports, but in the season for basketball, uh, men's and women's. With that being said, before I switch it over, Texas Southern fourth, speaking of the depth. Softball, man, Mm -hmm. it's pretty – Tremendous. There are two 12 teams, you know, you have in the East starting at the bottom as we go to the top, as they say, Mississippi Valley, Alabama, a and Jackson State, FAMU, Bethune-Cookman, and Alabama State. That is 20, 57, 68, 70, 79, and 105 points respectively. Alabama State easily uh, topped it with 13 first place votes. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody except for Valley did receive at least one first place vote. In the East, in terms of the West, you probably know who's at the top, but let's start at the bottom. Arkansas Pine Bluff, 27 points. Southern, 55 points. Alcorn State, 66 points. Texas Southern, 68 points. Grambling State at 82 points. And Prairie View A&M at 101 points. They also received 13 first place votes. And you had Grambling, Texas Southern, Alcorn, all receiving at least one uh, first place vote. Um, so that's deep over there as well. I'm going to go ahead and do uh, MEAC softball to give you the top eight before I shift back to you and give any thoughts that you want on that and uh, give some additional news that you might want to share as well. Top eight from the MEAC softball 2024 predicted order of finish, starting at number eight, Delaware State with 30 points. At number seven, South Carolina State at 33 points. Six, Maryland Eastern Shore at 50 points. Coppin State at 63 points. Norfolk State at 4, 83 points. Top three are starting with Howard with one first place vote, 90 points. Uh, North Carolina Central with five first place votes, 108 points. And Morgan State, 10 first place mm. vote and 119 points is your predicted order of finish for the MEAC. You heard it from the SWAC, Charles. Any thoughts in terms of the softball predicted order of finish in terms of the Division One programs? Not to mention that we do have the independents out there, both Tennessee State, Hampton, and North Carolina a and We'll let you know where they are looking in their conference at a later date. Yeah, the top three, when you take a look at the MEAC softball uh, predicted order of finish, Howard, uh, they reached out there with one first place vote. That was a, a eye-opening deal because when you take a look at MEAC softball, Morgan State, uh, I think, uh, rightly deserves to be uh, they're predicted to finish first, but uh, North Carolina Central, they, they were able to snap uh, five first place votes themselves. So you, you see where uh, the power, if you will, lies uh, with regards to the MEAC uh, softball preseason order of predictions. And then definitely in the SWAC. I mean, no surprise with regards to Alabama State, perennial uh, right there uh, in terms of the mix, in terms of being uh, the number one uh, swag softball team. And then Prairie View, of course, uh, Tab finishing in first place in the West. So, uh, man, it's so exciting. Uh, you see uh, the baseball players and softball players all in the weight room mm-hmm. right now uh, getting ready for the season. Uh, things kick off next week, softball and baseball. Good stuff, good stuff. What other news you got out there, Charles? Yeah, well, let's take a look at it. Uh, this is – uh, coming to us here, the uh, 2024 NBA HBCU Classic 
presented by AT&T from the uh, Winston-Salem Rams. And AT&T will be the presenting partner of the NBA HBCU Classic for the third consecutive year, uh, the NBA announced today. Uh, classic participants, including Virginia Union and Winston-Salem State from the CIAA, each will receive $100,000 from the NBA and AT&T as part of their ongoing commitment to support uh, HBCUs. Foot Locker, Google Pixel, Starry, and Under Armour will serve as associate partners of the HBCU Classic. Additionally, HBCUs will be showcased throughout the weekend through various activations and celebrations. And then this Saturday, uh, February 17th, next weekend, uh, coverage of the 2024 NBA HBCU Classic presented by AT&T will begin at 2 o'clock and simulcast on TNT, NBA TV, ESPN2 with Grant Hill, Chris Haynes, and Brian Cooster serving as the on-air broadcast team. So looking forward to that. Yeah, that's cool. I uh, like the way the NBA has been able to do that. Obviously, the first year, two years ago, is when they kicked these events off during the All-Star Weekend, and you started with MEAC participants last year. You had the SWAC participants this year. That's uh, C participants. So I imagine next year you get the CIAA involved. So that's fascinating. Question is, on the fifth year, will they rotate it back, keep it going? Will they dip down in the NIA with the GCAC? Uh, what may that look like? Uh, it would be interesting to see over the next couple of years, where they go and continue to go with this format. But certainly entertaining, been some good games, uh, good matchups, fascinating to see what the NBA is doing, and kudos to all involved. Before we go to this next break, I did want to shout this out. This is a little different off the beaten path. Fascinating to me as an academic, I got to put it on the table. Outside of the sports scenario, you would think, but I guess any institution – figures out a way maybe you do have some sporting context, even if it's intramural. But San Francisco moves to launch HBCU satellite campus from AxisSanFrancisco.com is where this is coming from. Uh, when you look, think about this, you know, you have your online classes, online programs. People have become very familiar with that. And you often have heard folks talk about regional locations, satellite mm. locations, but not one that usually is this far away so that's fascinating to think about what that thinks about so interesting to see uh, where that is going but san francisco is undertaking new efforts to bring historical black colleges and universities hbcus to downtown area eventually launching a satellite campus partnership with hbcu institutions why is it matter part of the more significant economic revitalization push in the city the initiative comes as HBCUs across the U.S. look to expansion opportunities to serve better and more black students who will be most adversely impacted by last year's U.S. Supreme Court ruling against race conscious submission. Detailed uh, black, back, blacks to San Francisco, an initiative led by the city's Human Rights Commission, will begin hosting HBCU programming this summer. The University of San Francisco will offer student housing accommodations while San Francisco State University will provide classroom state. The University of California at San Francisco will also collaborate with HBCUs to expand mental health mentoring, training, internships for students in the program. So at interesting, something to keep your eyes on, fascinating what this looks like, um, curious and, and good to see that these opportunities prevail, but uh, uh, good stuff it looks like that's going on with San Francisco and HBCUs. With that, let's take our first break, come back on the other side, and get back into it. As we said, sign of day was yesterday. We're going to talk to an expert in that area and get some general thoughts in terms of how they saw sign of day for HBCUs, particularly out of SWAT. Sneak in some other HBCUs as well. Dip our toe a little bit for the MEAC. Uh, catch it out. As you saw, HBCU Nightly did a really good job in terms of looking at the MEAC at their sign of day. So we're going to spin it around and see if we can go in the other direction. With that being said, stick with us. We'll be back after this quick break. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is always Ultra Thin's reinvented with the always triple protection system. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster, absorbs even more so you can feel dry, and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. 
The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell Leadership Principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. As technology continues to bring changes to the world of education, it's time we also reimagine teacher professional development. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all learning that can only be accessed at a specific time and place. The Stride PD Center is an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that allow educators to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. The best professional development plans are those that include a level of flexibility and choice for educators. Whether you're a teacher, school, or district, visit us today to take charge of your learning. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love that, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love that, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, cause he gon' teach a lesson. This is Dr. Ville inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is out on assignment. So we brought in Mr. Wilton Jackson, the second, the pride of Jackson State University in a lot of ways, uh, but also one of those many individuals that are getting it done over there at HBC game day among the other responsibilities you have. I know I cut it short. You can share a little bit more about yourself uh, to our guests that may not know that's been on the rock probably and don't realize what you're out there getting done how's it going and welcome it, to the show it is going good dr Kavir. It's, it's an honor just to be on your show you, you you can't talk about hbcu sports in any capacity without talking about dr Kavir and what you and what your show brings to the hbcu landscape so i'm just glad to uh that you had me on it and that i could join pleasure you're welcome you certainly welcome come back giving an opening statement like that no doubt <laughs> <laughs> with that being said, uh, tell everybody a little bit about yourself in terms of your connection with Jackson. I kind of teased it out, but where does that come from? So I'm born and raised in Jackson. Uh, been here. Um, it's not your like, fault. But, you know. it, it's not. It's not. <laughs> I, I blame my mom, my, my, my mom, my dad, my aunts. I mean, like, like I got, I have HBCU roots all over, man. Um, nice. My mom went to Jackson State. Dad went to Jackson State. Uh, several aunts. Uh, that went to Jackson State. Cousins went to Jackson State. Some went to FAMU, Tennessee State. But my real introduction to like HBCU sports, specifically like football, was Jackson State. Uh, I can remember as a kid before it was called, you know, this thing called the Soul Bowl. Uh, it was called the Capital City Classic for most of my childhood. So that was one of my introductions to that, um, you know, that game or uh, coming to Jackson State or uh, attending uh, the Jackson State and Southern game. That was always a big game growing up. Homecoming always brought out dramatic crowds. So, you know, what we've seen from Jackson State over the last couple of years for somebody like myself who's been here, you know, forever, like it's not it's not something that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's essentially, you know, a little bit about, you know, my connection to Jackson State. Now I'm also uh, teaching there um, oh, wow. and teaching there for like maybe about four or five years. Now the year's starting to to, uh, to add up. So I, I teach some sports courses there, cross platform sports writing and reporting and also a uh, sports culture course as well. Professor Jackson in the second. I like that. <laughs> Charles didn't tell me about that, man. I know y'all do intellectually well over there in Jackson. Hey, 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 you know, it's, I know y'all have to show out like that. All right. It's, it's, it's really funny how, how similar our stories are. Uh, Wilton, uh, he, he mentioned the Capital City Class. Of course, I predate him. It's the soul bowl to me, and it becomes right. Capital City Class. But uh, in terms of having those deep connections, uh, uh, in Jackson, in terms of parents being there, aunts, uncles, uh, friends, and uh, uh, everything under the sun was all circulating around Jackson State University. So, 
good guy. Help me find me a good guy to bring on here, Doc. How about that? Yeah, you know what you're doing. I get you there. <laughs> you know, that, you know. uh, maybe it's purposeful because you done did it so many times. It's kind of hard to be lucky that many times. It's so <laughs> hard to uh, but Professor Jackson, with that being said, anytime you need a guest lecturer, uh, just let me know. Uh, we'll Absolutely. support HBCUs across the board. And obviously, we do a lot of focus on athletic sports and those kind of things. But the passion is about really getting in front of our students, young people, and providing them with the tools that are necessary to be successful. This is just a means to deliver that uh, through sports, um, as you're doing, as we do through this show. And I'm not sure if many people really understand that when they talk about the dean of sports or when they talk about HBCU sports. Our ground level is not just pure uh, based on journalism or creative um, content as some people like to say or just even media people it's really about the educational platform in terms of what that looks like so without further ado let's get into it uh it's my understanding that you took some time uh to dig through all the information that comes out all the trapping in regards to signing day so we want to know let's start with the swag and if you would let's break it down there's a lot of teams 12 teams let's get into the west division first Okay. Kind of give me your thoughts in general, uh, if you would. Uh, what do you look at when you start hearing about the rankings um, and people putting rankings together? What What are you looking for to see the validity of what people are trying to put out? Well, when I look at the sweat, Wes, I think it's, you know, honestly, Dr. Bill, it's, it's, it's wide open. Like, I mean, it's, you think about just before, not even just when you start talking about the recruiting, but like think about the new coaches we have in the sweat, which will sweat, which, right? I mean, of course, you have Terrence Graves, you know, taking the position as head coach at Southern. So he has to bring in a new recruiting class. Of course, you know, Bob McDowell is not new, but uh, he's bringing in a new class. And, and what does that look like for Prairie View after the, the year? I don't know about you guys, but Prairie View, sometimes they have me on, on, on a heart attack waiting to happen because you just never know what, what might happen with them on certain weeks. But Who are you telling? You, 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 you get that. You get you get that prayer of your team, and it's like, I'm like, man, you know, so, like, the way that Bubba McDowell was able to shape this team and them still finding a way to get to the SWAC championship, I mean, kudos to him. So I'm, I'm interested to see what they're going to do. Um, and then, of course, the, the big one that everybody's talking about, of course, is, is Chris Dishman at, at Texas Southern and – uh, in his recruiting recruiting class, he had he signed like eleven true freshmen um, and four transfer athletes. And you guys know, uh, being out of the, the state of Texas, like it Texas is a hotbed for 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 high school football and college football in general. And not just you know those uh, not just high schools and just the, the traditional four year institutions and in, uh, in Texas colleges, but more so like even some of those junior colleges, community colleges, you can find some really good talent out there. And so you know, having known the background of Chris Dishman as he is as a coach. Um, this probably won't be the same six, Texas Southern team that we've seen over the last couple of years. Sometimes we've seen that team, you know, have these really, really high expectations. And then they, you know, injuries come in, they disappoint us. But then, uh, you know, this is a new a new regime coming in. And so we you you really have to take this this Texas Southern team pretty serious. And we'll just we'll just see the players that he brought in, what they'll be able to do coming into this this first season. Yeah, I heard he got a transfer. Charles was watching the uh, FCS championship game quarterback from texas and uh charles had a good question how did he get out of here all the way to montana was it montana state <laughs> well it looks like uh they yeah getting back here that's going to be interesting particularly yeah. if they lose body and as we switch over to the east we will talk a little bit about that but before we do that as you were just talking about texas southern i'd be remiss if i didn't showcase some of our high schools out there that happen to be coached by some hbcu guys south oak cliff yeah they got the running back danny mm. Green, who signed quietly recruited, small guy, but very talented. That's a team that's won multiple championships, been in the race over the last couple of years, uh, unheard of in a lot of ways from the inner city of Dallas. And you know the talent when you talk about Texas, but really coming out of Dallas, great talent to find a way to keep him in state at Houston. What are your thoughts a little bit about um, more particularly maybe running back Danny Green overall? 
I think he has an opportunity. Like he, he's smaller in size, but I mean, you, a lot of times you see some of the players that come in through the sweat. They may be smaller in size in some cases, but they still have a big impact. I think this is a running back potentially being that he's from Dallas and played for the program that you were just talking about at South Oak Cliff. I think he has a chance to come in and probably make an immediate impact. And it's another player in addition to Danny Green that they got from South uh, South Oak Cliff uh, as a wide receiver and Ricky Evans, another almost kind of like a slot type wide receiver, 5'9", 175. Um, I think he, he he could have some potential as well. So they have some really good some some really good pieces that are coming in. It's another guy that I actually know, uh, his older brother. Um, he kind of flew under the radar a little bit. Aaron Kizzy, a linebacker, 6'2", mm. 220 from, uh, from Houston, went to Shadow Creek High School. Uh, he oh. put on some – I've kind of watched him from a distance. He put on some weight over the years. And so I wouldn't be surprised if he's, he he brought some 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 um, – some talk and some traction to the swag next year as well. Shadow, Shadow Creek, Creek for those talent. folks out yeah. here is a relatively young program, as I'm sure Charles was about to put in there, but they've been able to make some strong runs in the playoffs, let you know how quick the talent and that talent pool out there that you know in that Houston area as you start to go to the t- suburbs uh, that has a lot of financial individuals of African-American black descent that are doing well. Yeah. You start them flourishing out Tascacita, uh, but uh, as you said, that's another good one when you talk about Pearland, Dawson Oldham, those kind of area. So you're getting kids out there. You're also getting kids with winning attitudes, exactly. which I run, imagine um, Chris Dishman is seeking to do. With that, Charles, ask the follow-up question, and let's go to the next segment. We'll go to the East, but let's stay in the West for right now. Yeah, I'm going to stay in the West, but I'm going to sort of change it up a little bit in terms of asking this question. A lot of uh, reveals, a lot of signing parties yesterday, Uh, even from a social media standpoint, uh, Mm. going into this season, which is going to be wide open, how do you think the fervor is with regards to SWAC fans in terms of this signing day uh, and and moving forward uh, going into the season? Uh, What is sort of the lay of the land with regards to SWAC fans looking at this signing day and hoping for the best in terms of next year. I think you know, Charles. Like I look at signing day, it's like you know what it is. It, it's, it's it's a step in the it's, it's the step in the direction of knowing that you're entering a new college football season. So I'm one of the the people that take the approach of you you can't really get too high, get too low because yes, you can look at it and say, oh, this player is from Texas, he's from Georgia, he's from Florida, he's three star, two star, four star. You know, if that was the case, and you can say, oh, we expect him to do well. Well, in actuality, like until these players put on pads, until they go through, you know, uh, spring workouts, it's, you know, obviously that's that process is, is, is about to start. But it's like you don't really know what you have until you actually get them in. And granted, and the only thing that we can go off right now is the programs that they played in the high school and specifically in the state of Texas. As you guys know, it's a lot of it's a lot of talent um, in that particular state. But when I if I'm a fan, I'm really looking specifically more so if I'm a Texas Southern fan. I'm, I'm excited about what I have uh, because this is starting a new chapter in Texas Southern football. I mean, you can only go up from this point, or at least that's the, the mindset that you want to you want to go up. And with a coach like Chris Dishman, you know he has a, a, a tough mentality of wanting to win. Um, and I think that you have to you have to look at this as promising in his first in his first season. And so, and you take away you, you take take yourself just uh, move yourself away from Texas Southern, and you look at all the SWAC schools in general. I think more than anything, it's still going to be exciting. You guys know better than me. Mm-hmm. Swag football, you know, well, HBCU football, whether it's SWAC, MEAC, and, you know, some of the other schools that are not in those conferences, like, it's going to always be exciting. Like, we'll be counting down the months, you know, after April and, and you know, spring games and stuff like that. We'll be counting down the months to July when, you know, we're talking about SWAC Media Day or we're, we're talking about MEAC Media Day. I mean, it's the, the excitement is only going to continue to grow, and I think that, uh, the state of HBCU football this year, it, if, in all honesty, I think it could be a little bit more exciting, specifically more so in the sweat because you have so many new coaches. And it's like some of the the, the the standard level coaches that have been there and had solidified some of these programs that we know that would typically be good. Things could be changing. Like take, mm-hmm. you know, I know we're going to get into the sweat piece in a minute, but take Bethune Cookman. Talking about yeah. one of the top HBCU programs that had a um, – top recruiting class amongst FCS programs on yesterday. So this is going to be different. Like this won't be the same Bethune-Cookman team that we saw last year. Uh, Raymond yeah. Woody brought in some, some dogs. And so granted, again, you can look at that and say, well, we have, they have a, a slew of, you know, transfer players coming in, but until you actually get them in, they learn the system of what he wants to put in at Bethune-Cookman, then you'll really find out what those players are made of. Sure. 
one more staying in the West. I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about Grambling. They, they've seen to put in some work. Uh, a lot of folks down there excited. They got it done in the State Fair Classic last week, last year, but things kind of fell apart, including losing the Bayou Classic. So they turned one in their favor, but then they lose the other. What are your thoughts in terms of Grambling, what they were able to do? Seems like a lot of people in that area are a little bit excited. No, Grand, that 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 is another school that I felt like that did really well, uh, considering, of course, you know, the, the loss of their uh their their head coach and now with the new coach. So I'm 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 not mad at the fans being excited. Some of the players that I saw that they that they brought into the program, uh the fans have a right to be excited. And like I said, <laughs> uh having that 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 well, when you look at their season last year, they started off pretty strong, but then they took mm-hmm. that slump. Um and so like I said, if, if I'm a fan, if I'm a Grambling State fan right now, I'm excited to see the players that we brought in. And again, uh, once you continue to uh, continue to acclimate them and get them adjusted to the program, I think it's going to, it's going to bode well for them. Good stuff. Let's take our next break. We'll come back on the side on the other side and talk a little bit about the East. See if we can get these guys to keep their excitement and containment level as they feature into the East and talk a little bit about Jackson state. Oh, by the way, we did a little thunder there and talked about Bethune Cookman about maybe not letting sleeping dogs, cats lie uh, <laughs> from that perspective. You got the Rattlers, the champions. You got Roy talking about they signed the best transfer class. I didn't even know they measured that. <laughs> <laughs> so he got to find a way to get in there and see what uh, happens. How about, that? how about that convenient graphic? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a next break before we get in more trouble, man. He got folks just popping stuff on the screen. We'll talk to you in a minute. Stick with us. We'll be right back. I don't know Since how. 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational. Powerhouse, intelligent and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K E A V E R S V O I C E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. No. No. Come on, him. Ooh, I like him. The Quicker Picker Upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the Quicker Picker Upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love that. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Charles Bishop as well as Professor Wilton Jackson II, SWAC analyst extraordinaire, giving us some insight of signing day and beyond about what to look forward to next year's folks always have football Joneses, and you said it perfect. I'm not sure it matter who was signed in the SWAC, <laughs> particularly over the last couple of years with the expansion. They're just storylines galore. And they do not stop all season around. If you wanted to, you literally could talk swag football pretty much every day of the week, 365 days black, as they would say it for the swag. We try to diversify, but Charles finds a way to reel me back in. But he's right. So that's what the fans want. I'm like, man, 
<laughs> but we got our specials in here, so we're going to give the people what they want, as they say, uh, speaking of the good folks out there. Well, let's go to the East. I know the East has been the king. That's why I wanted to start with the West. We're trying to figure it out over there a little more than everybody else. Uh, last three years since expansion, the champion has come out of the East. They've uh, locked the door. In the last two years, they actually dominated the conference when you looked at the crossover games, total wins. Um, and we came out the door with this expansion in 2021 mm -hmm. with Alcorn sliding over. That was the previous dominant program. Many folks thought the West would be the superior division. Uh, were we fooled? Other than Charles. Charles warned us and told us <laughs> real quick. And then about halfway through the season when he started looking at those numbers, he did a little data analysis taking Mike's role, and he made sure I knew that as well. With that being said, is the East still going to stay dominant? And if so, tell us why based on what took place yesterday uh, in some of these transfer signings as well. So when you look at the East, like you, you're talking about, obviously, Jackson State, FAMU, uh, Alabama State. And so I'm going to start with Jackson State first. They brought in 26 new players to the team. Uh, and you're talking about a team that's going to keep, you know, obviously J uh, Jacoby and Morgan is going to be back at quarterback. Zach McDonald's going to be back. Uh, they're going to have some some key running backs uh, that's going to be back. Um, Evan Neal will be back at, at center. Um, but, you know, some of, the, some of the players that they brought in, a lot of them, um, some of them have are, are from Mississippi. Um, either are from Mississippi or they played in a program in the state of Mississippi. So on the defensive side of the ball, they, they brought in a defensive back from uh, Jones College, Sadiq Thompson, somebody to look out for. A defensive back, Tony McCray from Georgia State, really liked um, really liked some of the tape that I saw on him. Um, and then also um, a defensive back from Georgia State, Jalen Tate, uh, somebody mm -hmm. to keep an eye on as well. But really, of course, and, and when I when I talk about the defense, Jack State's defense, we know that it, it still was pretty strong for the most part last season. Mm -hmm. uh, secondary was tops in the conference and, and coming up with interceptions. And, you know, we know what they were able to do. But any anybody that knows Jackson State, when it comes to Jackson State football, the one key factor that always matters, that will always matter is what does the offensive line look like? So mm -hmm. and if you look at the recruiting class that they had, they brought in – what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, almost eight offensive linemen. Like you had one, uh, an offensive lineman. You guys may be more familiar with him than I am from North Texas, uh, Isaiah Villanueva. Uh, mm -hmm. Then also an offensive lineman, Lewis from Louisville High School, Devin Love. Uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty consistent guy. I like the tape that I saw on him as well. Um, and then, of course, from a local standpoint, they had a guy, Sison Burke from Ridgeland High School, that I think that could have potential to be in the mix as well. Um, and so when you look at this Jackson State team, everybody pretty much – well, I can't say everybody. A lot of people doubted what T.C. was going to do in his first year post Deion Sanders' uh, mm -hmm. tenure at Jackson State. Mm -hmm. um, anything he continued to – you know, each through, through each week throughout the season, continued to defy the odds. So if you're T.C., you couldn't have asked for a better first season. Um, and now it's just like you're going to continue to build on what you have. And from looking at this recruiting class of what they have and considering some of the players that they have coming back, uh, that you know, some jumped into the transfer portal and opted to come back. This is still very much a team that can compete in the SWAC East, especially now that, like, you know, FAMU is having some changes, of course, where they, you know, have a new coach in, in, in Coach Kazi. Um, you know, of course, Bethune Cookman in, in, in Alabama State, but this is still a Jackson State team that can very well still compete for a, um, a SWAC title this year, man. So, we still got to worry about Jackson State. Yes, D. I love it. Charles. Go ahead, <laughs> here, man. Um, and I, there's a, a thousand places to go, but uh, especially you mentioned uh, Jackson State. They're always going to be uh, focused on the offensive line, but I wanted to focus on another position because you know, as the saying goes, uh, you, you have a quarterback. You're you're halfway there with Andrew Body now coming over from uh, Texas Southern to Alabama State. Uh, in the, especially in the Swackies, were there any signings with regards to the quarterback position that kind of raised an eyebrow? Um, you mean as far as like other quarterback signings in the Swackies? Yeah. Um, not super big, but I will. There is one. Um, at, at FAMU, the quarterback Daniel Richardson, he comes from Florida Atlantic. Uh, he played at FAU and Central Michigan, and and um, he could be mm -hmm. in a potential battle, you know, with Junior Miratovich. 
uh, at FAMU yeah. as, as their starter next year. So that could be something to watch. Uh, FAMU, of course, had some other players, some other key players to come in, a running back from Florida State by the name of Rodney Hill. Uh, he'll be somebody to uh, to keep an eye on as well. But as far as like the quarterback situation, uh, Dane Richardson from FAU uh, could be could be one to watch. No problem. You Good teased stuff. out a little bit about Bethune Cookman. Go ahead and give me some more insight. Uh, obviously, the uh, news came out that they were what second and third, top ten um, in terms of all FCS ranking, number one HBCU program in terms of the FCS ranking. Yeah, so they were in in the, in the top two amongst uh, HBCUs for FCS recruiting classes. Uh, number one, we already knew this one. Uh, Coach Woody's son, Raymond Woody III, transferred from, from California, so he's there now. But when you really look at this this list of players that they got, uh, it's heavy on the transfer side. It's 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 several that they brought from the high school ranks. And those the, the, the players that they brought from the high school ranks are your traditional, what you would expect from – uh, you know, from the state of Florida, especially if you're talking about, you know, on the offensive side, speed, you're going to have that. Uh, they have, they also had some, some, some big guys they brought from the high school ranks that won championships on the high school level that I think are going to be competitive as well. So I wanted to put that, that, that point out there as well. But from a transfer standpoint, they brought in a wide receiver uh, by the name of Sean Russ. Uh, he played at Arizona State before he decided to transfer, he initially committed to Florida, um, but now he'll be there as well. Uh, and a lot of these players, what I noticed about them, they were at other schools, but they didn't have much playing time at a lot of these other schools. So you're talking about fresh legs. Um, you know, they'll be able to bring a lot of experience, power five experience and exposure from some of these programs that they played at and bringing that to a, a Bethune Cooking program that's looking to solidify its place in the Swag East. And of course, under uh, Raymond Woody's direction, uh, you're talking about a running back. Also, Courtney Reese. Uh, spent four years at University of uh, Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he has a track uh, background from a high school in Miami, so that tells you right there he has a lot of speed. Um, <laughs> they have a, a, a defensive lineman uh, by the name of Oren Patu. Uh, he spent one year at Arizona and three seasons at California. He was a four-star recruit coming out of high school, so that tells you a little bit about him. Uh, defensive lineman Thomas Nance, uh, he came from Tennessee State. He didn't play in 2023, but he also spent a couple seasons at uh, South Florida from, from 2019 to 2021. Uh, he was a former three-star prospect coming out of high school. Uh, they had a linebacker, uh, Tremaine uh, Mejia Pastor. Uh, he came from Colorado State, didn't play for them uh, last season, but he spent his first three seasons at, at California. So, again, you're seeing a lot of, like, strong Power 5, uh, you know, experience coming into uh, BCU. And then you look at a, a defensive end, Dallas Corbett. Uh, he spent five seasons at UCF. Uh, but he only played in the 2022 and 2023 seasons. Um, he was like the number 19 player in the state of South Carolina uh, coming out of high school. They also brought in a cornerback uh, by the name of Terrence Alexander from Jacksonville State. Um, and some of those high school players, two, two players that stood out to me was an offensive lineman by the name of William Roberts. Uh, he had offers from Colorado, FIU, Marshall, and Miami. He also was on a team that won a, uh, a Florida Class 7A state title. Um, and then an offensive line, lineman by the name of Varen Clark. He's from Miami Gardens, um, played at uh, Miami Northern High School, helped them to a 14-1 in record. So, again, anytime you have, you know, a, a team where you're trying to, you know, set your pace and set your mark on what this identity and what, and what your team is going to look like, whether it's from, you know, having a good quarterback, you also need to have a strong offensive line. So they have some, some pretty strong recruits. But, again, I still won't say this is an automatic win to say they're going to win this Wack East next year. I mean, this, the competition is still going to be tough. The games are still going to be played on the grass. Um, and, and it's just going to make for a more exciting uh, a, a more exciting brand of HBCU football next season. Well, for the fans out there that, that are entertained by that, you, you, you set us ablaze in terms of all that information. Uh, but for those that are weak of heart, uh, you just gave a little more pain. You talk about the swag, particular swag. Each just got deeper. Oh yeah, thanks for sharing that, Charles. Yeah, I hey, tell you what, I'm just doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. And I think you touched on something that I'm really excited about uh, in terms of uh, you've had a lot of churning in the conference, either coaching or rosters or whatever the case might be. But I think that's going to make for a really exciting uh, season. Uh, because I don't have a clear-cut favorite. I do not have a clear-cut favorite in the oh, SWAC yeah. West. I, I don't have a clear-cut favorite in the SWAC East. Yeah. And uh, you start kind of start paying attention to some of these rosters and how quickly, you know, they can gel with the coaching and things of that nature. And 
And, you know, you never know where, where light and might strike this upcoming 2024 season. So I'm really excited uh, to get to Swag Media Day and really find out a lot more because we always know after spring practice, there are going to be some more transfers coming in. Uh, as you get toward uh, actually uh, getting toward uh, 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 fall practice, if you will, there'll be another trickle of transfers. So, uh, you know, I, I, it, it just doesn't stop. We'll be talking football pretty much year round. Absolutely. And, and to your point, one thing, one, one, when I look at like the changing of, of, of coaches in the SWAC East specifically uh, with, with Coach Cosby taking over at FAMU and, you know, granted, that was a lot of, you know, many, many days of figuring out who was going to be the next coach at FAMU. Um, I'm not mad about the hire that they, that they brought in. I had a chance to kind of spend some time with Coach Cosby before the celebration, but we, we, we talked maybe about 25 mm-hmm. or 30 minutes and I could automatically kind of just feel, you know, his, his level of ambition uh, obviously, coming from the defensive side of the ball, his level of ambition, his his energy, like he's gonna be ready to go. I don't, I, I can't say that FAMU is gonna win the SWAC East again and get to the Celebration Bowl or SWAC Championship or, or what have you. But I do think that this is still gonna be a, a team that's gonna be a force to be reckoned with. Um, and I don't think him as a coach is gonna you, you're gonna see a a decline. So between him and then also, uh, and Charles, you mentioned this with, with Andrew Body coming to Alabama State, you, and this is no discredit to the quarterbacks they've had before Body. But now, again, if Body can stay healthy mm. with a, a, a lethal defense that Alabama State has had over the last couple of years, they could be they could become a favorite quick if they can put it together. Because Eddie Robinson mm. is not a bad coach, you know. Nice. So being able to kind of yeah. watch and see what what he does, and then of course Jackson State with TC and, and what they're putting together, it's gonna be it's gonna be exciting. Yeah, yeah, new offensive coordinator yeah. at Alabama State. They got to score some yep. points now. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then you got Alabama A and M over there quietly lurking, and you just never know when they might just get enough to get right. You know, everybody likes to be like, "Ah, oh, they done." That's the perfect time. It seems like uh, when they find a way to bite, you literally, uh, no pun intended. With that being said, last thing here I want to bring to the table is body. I mean, is body? It seems like body. What you hear, particularly with it being Super Bowl week, I guess we can tease this a little bit out with San Francisco and Purdy. You know, people have two ways. They either think he's like the next big time thing coming, or people are like down in the dump. Yeah. And it's interesting when you think about body, uh, how he moves the needle one way or the other. People really don't think much about him, or they think everything about him, and it, it's just weird to see that case. And it reminds me of so much what people are talking about Brock Purdy at the NFL level. Obviously, certainly a different level, and I'm not saying he's the same type of player, but uh, just the framework of how people talk to him. With that, what are your final thoughts in terms of moving in there? Because we want to bring you back. I really enjoy the way that you break this stuff down. And a couple of Sundays ago um, on Sports Wrap, Brian and AD did a breakdown where they looked at the schedule. Mm-hmm. And they looked at the schedule based on the win percentage of last year and talked about who had the toughest schedule and those things. So in a couple of weeks, I'd like to get your thoughts on that as we get into spring ball. Talk a little bit about spring ball, but then we can talk a little bit about the scheduling and just your general thoughts. I'll uh, get that information on there. Maybe we can sneak Brian in here to kind of uh, play the data and bring that to your table and get your thoughts on that. But before we go, your final thoughts in terms of what we can look forward to. No, I, I think when I when I when I think about specifically, and and I'm gonna tie it into to Andrew Brody real quick, and then get to some others. But uh, Andrew, when I look at him, it's it's more so because when I think of Brock Purdy, you know, people are saying, oh, he's a game manager. Yet he found a way to make some plays in the NFC Championship game to to win the game. Uh, when I think when I look at Andrew Body, I don't see game manager i think more so than anything if he stays healthy and when he is healthy he can make plays like he is a he he's a playmaker he's a game changer um and i think coming into a a program like alabama state uh and and like i said this is no discredit to to the the work that he was able to produce and and do at texas southern but i think he enters an alabama state program that has truly established a winning mindset right now like granted mm-hmm. i feel like coach mckinnon was building to that i think uh coach Dishman is, is going to create that at texas southern but it, with eddie robinson at alabama state there's just a, a certain there's a certain mm-hmm. layer that's already in place and if you're somebody like andrew Biden, i've had a chance to talk to him briefly during swag media days he wants to win he wants to do whatever it takes to win um you know and granted all the things about him you know uh transferring from texas southern joining 
uh, Alabama State. I think this could be the best possible fit for him to really not only take his game to the next level um, in that program, but then also seeing Alabama State really take that next step. In, and it's not to say that Alabama State hasn't been relevant, but Charles can probably attest to this, and you as well, uh, Dr. Cavill. During my childhood, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little biased. I watched Jackson State a lot. There were so many times that, like, Alabama State held Jackson State's number a lot of ways. <laughs> Even just going back to, you know, remembering the quarterback. And I'm, I know you guys know this guy, Tavares, Tavares Jackson, yep, yep. you know. And it's like uh, they do. always held Jackson State's number. He was, And Tavares Jackson, rest in peace, he was a phenomenal quarterback. Phenomenal yep. at Alabama State. And so when you think about that and think about some of the quarterbacks they've had in previous years, D. Davis, and, of course, last year's quarterback, Body is, is one of those players that if given the opportunity and the right pieces around him, a strong offensive line, like he could really be a game changer from mm-hmm. that aspect. So I'm going I'm to I'm put a pin in that right there. But as far as like overall with HBCU football next season, I think it's going to be one of the more exciting times. Uh, I think we, we still are seeing high quality players still coming into to HBCUs, whether it's the SWAC, the MEAC. And even at, you know, Tennessee State, they had their first winning season in, in six seasons. You know, shout out to Coach Eddie George, you know, taking taking the route that he still is to to build that program back up. Uh, but it won't be any stretch, no no shortage of, of fun, excitement, um, and high-quality football next season within within the HBCU ranks. You great heard it right here from Professor yeah. Wilson Jackson the second. Great information, great insight. Thank you, Charles, for hooking that up. You wanted to say something? Well, yeah, I was saying, uh, and then in terms of this conversation of Andrew Body. I uh, probably oh, yeah. no more no more polarizing player I think yeah. in the conference uh, when you because that's a great uh, analogy when you take a look at the way uh, the NFL looks at Brock Purdy it, it, it is something similar in terms of taking a look at you know you're either all in or not quite there with Andrew Body so it's fascinating <laughs> with him going over to the Swackies with Alabama State and you can make the argument that Alabama State is potentially the next team up if you're talking about the yeah you start turning that cycle yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Especially you, when you can you can make an early case for it yeah, yeah. You, can, yeah. you can make that well you talking about story in the hornet nest we did it here again but that means said we'll take this last break no pun intended in <laughs> yeah all pun intended <laughs> professor Wilson jackson the second we appreciate you we'll be right back after this last break Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and Parenting Education Coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational, powerhouse, intelligent, and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K-E-A-V-E-R-S-V-O-I-C-E dot com. Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice, Kevers Voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. (laughs) Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website, www.slowburnwaco.com. That's www.slowburnwaco.com. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna lose, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. Cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. 
This is Dr. Ville with Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Charles, we want to get in a little bit of basketball talk um, and get your thoughts on some of the matchups coming up this weekend. Uh, looking at the SWAC and the MEAC, I'll tell you whose games that are lined up, and I want to know your thoughts in terms of who are the best teams or who do you kind of think are some of the best matchups, I should say. Uh, we'll look at it both from the MEAC as well as the SWAC. Uh, maybe sneak in some of those games uh, with uh, in the Ohio Valley uh, with Tennessee State getting it going tonight. You have Tennessee State on the road at Lindenwood. Remember, that's the transfer program that went from Division II, Division I, their second year uh, in the conference getting it done. Tennessee State beat them uh, earlier. Uh, be interesting as you're starting to see the second half of that play. And then, obviously, you have uh, on the women's side, uh, you have – uh, North Carolina A&T at Charleston, looking at those matchups. Uh, you have a game today with A&T at Charleston. Uh, Charleston is 16-7, and seven, so it's a tough one for the Aggies on the men's side. It'll be interesting to see what that looks like. Uh, but getting into it a little more in terms of the SWAC. Starting the second half, you saw nine of them go down. Uh, mm -hmm. You see at the top of the conference right now, you have Southern and Grambling tied for first, and behind them it's Texas Southern. But what do you see going into this second half of the season, first weekend to get things started? You have Alcorn at Pine Bluff, PV on the road, along with Texas Southern on that Florida swing. PV's at Bethune-Cookman, Texas Southern at FAMU in terms of Tallahassee. And then you have the Alabama schools as they go to Louisiana. Uh, Alabama State takes on Grambling first, Alabama A&M on Southern. And obviously, you know those games flipped. Closing it out with Jackson State at Mississippi Valley. So we have a little bit of that Mississippi rivalry going there. Mm -hmm. uh, this is interesting as uh, on the men's side, you know, Valley hadn't got a win, uh, but they playing a Jackson State team to struggle a little bit. Uh, what games are you looking at this weekend? Yeah, I think you touched on it. Uh, the question is, can Jackson State get off the schneid? They've lost uh, four in a row, but things are so jam-packed. Uh, in the SWAC, uh, when you take a look at the top two teams, Southern and Grambling, both at 7-2. Uh, they got the Alabama schools coming into Louisiana this weekend. I think you're going to get some great games, both with Alabama A&M and Alabama State, uh, especially uh, the one that I'm really kind of uh, peeking at is uh, Southern uh, versus Alabama State. I think that's going to be a great one. Uh, uh, when you take a look at it, you got Southern Grambling 72, Alabama State 6-3, Texas Southern 6-3. Then the next tier – of teams, uh, Pine Bluff and, and, and Bethune Cookman both sit at five and four. This is going to be a, a, a interesting road swing, I think, for the Texas schools, uh, especially uh, Prairie View playing Bethune Cookman Saturday night, and then I think a huge one is going to be Texas Southern and Bethune Cookman on Monday night. You know, I, the, for me, all the crazy stuff happens on Monday night. Uh, for me, that's the Monday night game to watch Texas Southern and Bethune Cookman over at Moore Gym. I polled a few coaches. Uh, around the conference uh, over the past couple of weeks, they all to a man say that is the place they least want to go is uh, <laughs> going to more gym. That that is that is a little bit too much. It's uh, a reminder of the old school gymnasium. So uh, the, the crowd is right there on you. So they they've taken the the place, if you will, of the old Alabama A and M gym, the old Valley gym, in terms of being the more one of the more hostile uh, gyms uh, in the sweat. And then Monday night on the women's side of the ball. Huge one, Jackson State at UAPB. That's one I'm looking forward to. That's good stuff, good stuff. When you talk about um, those key matchups, you can see it going any direction. On the women's side, obviously, Jackson State comes in, clean sweep of the first season at 9-0. and But you got a red-hot Arkansas Pine Bluff team. They've won four in a row, 7-2, and two, looking really hot in terms of the mix. And then just beneath that, you have Gramlin State. Uh, with new coach playing some really good basketball in a lot of ways. Fascinating to see what they're doing. Um, and then you have three teams tied uh, behind them with Southern Jaguars, Prairie View A&M, and Alabama A&M. What's intriguing about those programs that are five and four is you've seen highs and you've seen lows. They've yeah. kind of gone in multiple directions. So it would be interesting to see if any of those three uh, teams can kind of like turn the page. Can they get that uptick? to make a statement in the final half of the season that they'll find a way to maybe uh, go deeper into the race. Any thoughts on that? 
No, I, I think that's an interesting look, see, uh, especially Jackson State's women. Uh, they got the nose blooded a little bit uh, against Southern. Uh, and I, that was uh, interesting to see. But to their credit, they fought back. But that game was at home. Uh, and they got a couple of road games uh, that uh, bear watching. Uh, I think the UAPB game bears watching for me. And then for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, but the, the Texas swing, the Texas trip, uh, always seems to be a tough go uh, for Jackson State's women, especially going out to Prairie View. So uh, uh, they were they were the ones who ended Jackson State's last uh, long uh, regular season win streak. So I, I think there are a couple of, a couple of games to watch with regards to Jackson State's women. They've been dominant thus far. They've been fun to watch. Uh, watching them come back against Southern, I thought that was huge. Uh, and then just seeing, uh, and I was talking to a couple coaches today. At this point in the season. You got nagging injuries uh, just as you get over the halfway point. And it's going to be really interesting to see how teams kind of navigate minutes uh, of some of the starters to have some, some fresh legs uh, down the stretch and, and try to have some momentum a, as we move towards March. So I think that's going to be kind of interesting to watch. Before I get you back and talk about the men's side with Tennessee State, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about North Carolina A&T and the Aggies and what they've been doing. They won eight straight. They have a matchup that features two 14 and 16. That's North Carolina A&T sitting at 8 and 1 in the conference and Charleston uh Coastal I mean Charleston College of Charleston Cougars is sitting 6 and 3. Big matchup to maintain the matchup that is coming uh near the end of the season with Stony Brook that's tied with them at 8 and 1 in first place, but you got to get past uh this Cougar team. Um so I'm intrigued about this matchup as you look at it. Um, going on, which is a game that will be played tonight as they're on the road. So keep your eyes on that. Any general thought in terms of just how well the Aggies are playing? Important for them to get a, a win tonight and, and not look forward to that uh, to that matchup against Stony Brook. I think that's going to be huge for North Carolina A&T. A little bit about the men's side. Tennessee State, uh, they were playing some good basketball. They played the top team in the conference, uh, didn't do too well last week, but they got a chance. The level set as they start to get things going – Again, top five program. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, against Lindenwood? Uh, they sit at 13 to 10, 8 and 15. Is Lindenwood in terms of that matchup? They are on the road. You always know it's tough to be on the road. Yeah. Um, but Lindenwood is just two and eight. They're still trying to figure out their spaces. They're moving it to that Division One level. Any problems you see with Tennessee State this week as they are three games back of Moorhead State Eagles? Again, they dropped that crucial game, but they're still yeah. in the mix a little bit. Uh, tied with uh, SIU at six and four, and uh, behind three teams to trying to get in that f- top four seeds, getting ready for that tournament. But behind Western Illinois, they defeated them at eight and two. Uh, but UT Martin, Skyhouse, Little Rock, Trojans are sitting at seven and four as well. Uh, any thoughts of Tennessee State in terms of Lindenwood? No, I think they get the win against Lindenwood uh, with regards to Tennessee State. I think defense and rebounding, that, that travels well uh, anytime uh, you do that well. And Tennessee State is in the upper echelon of the OBC in terms of defense and rebounding. So I expect to get for them to get the win on the road. Uh, the MEAC, they're off pretty much this weekend as they kind of flip things uh, with just 14 teams. You do have the Chicago State matchup with South Carolina State. We'll see what that looks like. Um, any final thoughts in terms of basketball? Uh, I'll let you have that. But before you do that, I'd be remiss I didn't share the top five in terms of what's sh- shaped out. I'll just provide the top five teams. On the women's side, nobody dropped out, did get a rearrangement of teams. You have number five, Miles Lady, Golden Bears, 17-3, and 13-1. and one. In the SIAC, you have a number four, Virginia State Lady Trojans. Uh, they do fall to a spot, I should say, 18-3, and 9-3. Uh, number three, you have Xavier, Golden Nuggets. 17 and 4, 14 and 2 in the Red River Athletic Conference. Very strong there. And number two, Fayetteville State Lady Broncos, 19 and 2, 12 and 1, three first place votes. Uh, and you have Russ Lady Bearcats continue to get it done, 19 and 3, 11 and 1, uh, remain at number one and really having a good season. Wanted to give you a chance to kind of uh, brag a little bit about the mid major on the lady side. Uh, yeah, let me, uh, as I'm constantly reminded, let me make sure I contact Russ Lady Bearcats coach, try to get them on the program before we get immersed in the, in the baseball. So, uh, I, so a certain member of my household can get off my case about it. So, 
Hey, I tried to make sure you got that shine. We got them at number one. So you do it. <laughs> you just tell them they are number one. Dr. Yeah. Will got them number one. So we are talking about it. on the men's side, Langston still gets it done. But let's look at the top five. We did have a team drop out. I will say that Benedict Tigers hit a rough spot. They lost two in a row. Remember, mm. this team that came in undefeated in regular season uh, took tough losses to Clark Atlanta Morehouse, and now they following on hard time. So be interesting to see if they can right that ship. They're at 11 and four. And while you had three teams out of the SIC, that's changed this week because now you have number five and Xavier Gold Rush. They jump in there 16 and four, 13 and three, playing some good ball in the Red River Athletic Conference. They're second seeded in the conference race right now, a game behind the top team there, playing good, but they were not ranked last week. They jump in. And number four, Morehouse Maroon Tigers, they stay there. I'm sorry, Morehouse moves up a spot from five. They're 18 and four, nine and two, and they're playing some really good basketball. They're leading the division, even though they have that loss. That rematch could be crucial to see who comes out of the Eastern Division of the SIEC to try to get that number one seed in the tournament. Although in the SIEC tournament, I'm not sure if it matters much. Um, I will say this also it's just tough for what's going on. CIAA, Winston Salem State, they've fallen to like fourth in their seed. So I didn't have any team. This is the first time I've ever I know it. I didn't have any CIAA team, not only in the top five, but even receiving votes. They're all stacked up there, multiple losses. So we will say this about the tournament. It will be fascinating. It will Reed's be still fascinating. number three. Talladega's Tornadoes are 18 and three, 12 and three. They move up one spot from number four last week. And number two, Clark Atlanta Panthers. I like what they're doing, 17 and four, 11 and four. Got in a little thing after the end of the game. I hope that doesn't lead to any suspension because they are doing well playing some good basketballs. They've ride the ship playing some good basketballs, as I say right now. Prank, previous rank three, they move up a spot, 64 points. Leaving us to Langston Lions. Bounce back from that loss. Uh, they're 21 and 1, 14 and 1. Uh, first HBCU program with 20 wins. Looking good doing it. Eight first place votes. They still hold on all. That does it for the top five mid-major. Anything on the mid-major from the men's side? Uh, yeah, kudos to uh, Morehouse and Clark uh, getting it done. Uh, Langston, week in, week out, they've been uh, number one. Keep an eye on the two Blue Bulldogs. Uh, Coach Eric Struthers, uh, congratulations to him, getting a 50 wins in, uh, in his head coaching career. Uh, the first of many milestones, I think, for him. But, you know, two Blue, they, they had a tremendous season last year. They've uh, followed up, uh, uh, had a – a tough opening, but they, they've got it going now, 18-4 and four on the season, 11-2 and two in conference play. But keep an eye on them in terms of jumping in to the top five. You did it well. Good call. They're right outside. Basically, they'd be ranked six. So you're talking about 18-4, and 11-2. And, and they got a win over Tuskegee. Obviously, Tuskegee's not playing as well as it could be. But you talk about taking the Division two. They got it done. So great point that you pointed that out. Yeah, to, uh, and Brandon King pointed it out for us. Uh, uh, Tennessee State and Lindenwood, they're tied uh, going in overtime. Oh, wow. That's That must be the women's side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's after the women. Shout out to the women. They got that win over uh, Southern Illinois that was previously undefeated in the conference play. They got the win last week, and now they're struggling a bit. Boy, I tell you, it's just tough when you get in the conference play, no matter who you are, where you are. With yeah, that being is. said, let's tie it up in a bowl. That'll do it for us. Thank you for listening inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Watch and Charles Bishop. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the show with Professor Milton Jackson II, bringing it home and giving you the insight on signing the day and what to think and what uh, in terms of next season for the football season, way, way too early uh, analysis, but never too early to talk about football in the swag. That is. Again, we thank you for listening to Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock right here. We look forward next week as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, as they say. Facebook, Inside the HBC Sports Lab, and YouTube. Uh, dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Lecture. Count down to 500. Roy? Dismissed. <laughs>